So, I'm going to talk about genetic algorithms, but first, a concept that precedes it by uh, a bit, which is the beam search. So given a problem where you have a state that has many successor states, so for example, you have a, a chessboard and there's many possibilities of moving pieces and thus resulting in different chessboards, right? When you have a problem like this that has states and successors, the beam search algorithm searches like this. It expands all the successors of the one state that you're in, or the initial state, and it picks the ones with the best, uh, with the first, with the best performance metric, or uh, with the best um, function. Okay. Then it expands those two, okay, in turn. So it will expand those two states, and from the states that the, that uh, are successors of those states, it will select, you know, the best few, say the two be best states, and then it expands the solutions and so on and so forth, okay, until one of the states that it expands to is the solution state, okay. Now, here's what happens with these. What happens is that you reduce the search space by a lot because there are many states that you just don't expand. You only expand those states that are actually giving giving you some gains, okay? You're basically like that natural selection. You're just selecting those states, you're selecting the fittest states, the ones with the best performance to expand and see if among those states you will find your solution. Well, so this concept is very similar to the concept of genetic algorithms. So with genetic algorithms, they were introduced in the 1970s, they begin with a set number of randomly generated states, which we call a population. And now each state, each state, which we'll call an individual, is a string over some alphabet or a chromosome. Okay? So we will represent each state, if it's a game board, if it's maintenance schedules, whatever the, the states are, we will represent it in a string, okay? which will be our chromosome. Then there's a fitness function which says, well, how good is this chromosome over the other chromosomes, okay? So, and, and with a fitness function, usually a bigger number is a better number, right? Then we will go into a process by which we will cross over, reproduce those genes, that, those chromosomes that are most fit. And then we might, the, each, each of these offsprings might have one mutation, therefore they start evolving. And then we, again, compute a fitness function, or well, then we do crossover and mutate, you know, until some termination condition is achieved. So let's look at this with the example of the eight queens problem. The eight queen problems, the eight queens problem consists of placing eight queens in an eight by eight chessboard such that no queen is attacking each other. So let's say, for example, we have this is one state here, right? Right here, this is one state, and this is another state. Okay, and then the idea here is that there's good features that are passed on to the children, right? So at some point we're going to reproduce this state. When reproduced with this state, what happens is that, for example, it results in this state where this first half correspond is from, say, the mother, and the second half comes from the father, if you will. Okay. So that's the idea, that's the intuition behind genetic algorithms. There's two states which are individuals, and when they reproduce, the offspring gets the best part of each individual. Let's look at the intuitions um, then a little bit more in depth. What we need to know now is what is going to be a fitness function for these guys. Okay? So we know that fitness in the fitness function more is better, right? A higher number is a better number. So in the fitness function, we're going to say, well, the fitness function is going to be the pair of non-attacking queens. Therefore, you know, if there are uh, uh, eight non-attacking queens, right? So if there's 28 non-attacking queens, 28 pairs, then that is a full uh, uh, success, right? If there's zero non-attacking queens, it means that every queen is attacking each other, and that's a bad board. So bigger numbers of pairs of non-attacking queens are better. So let's look at, for example, um, some non-attacking queens here. What would be 
the fitness function of this, right, this board. The fitness function for this board, for example, would be, well, there's this queen's one, two, three, four, five, six non-attacking pairs there, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven non-attacking pairs there, eleven so far here, eleven, then with this one, we go um, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on and so forth. And you will realize that there's 23 pairs of non-attacking queens here. Okay, And that's how, that's how we compute the fitness function. So uh, check that these are 23 non-attacking uh, non pairs. Now, we know how to compute a fitness function given a board. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to represent this board as a string. And what we can do is represent this as a string of eight positions, in which each, each position will tell me where the queen is. So I can number the states, one, the squares, one, two, three, and so on and so forth, and one, two, three, and so forth for the columns. So, for example, to represent this board, I will say two, because the first queen is in the second position, four, because that queen, uh, the third queen there is, uh, the second queen is in the fourth position, seven, because the third, the queen on the third column is in the seventh position, four, eight, five, five, whoops, and two. So this string here, two, four, seven, four, eight, five, five, two, is a good representation of the board above it. So now we know how to get a fitness function and how to represent each board as a chromosome or a string. So then here's the, the algorithm, right? First we represent states, right? And we compute their fitness function. So for example, this state is actually the one that I showed you the fitness function of, uh, we compute the fitness function of, is 23. This state is the one that I represent as a string with a fitness function of 24, 20, and 11. So we compute the fitness function, okay? Then what we're going to do is we're going to compute the probabilities of any of these guys to be chosen. And to compute those probabilities, we add these numbers, we add these guys, right? So we end up with 47, 67, uh, 77, right? So 77, right? And then we divide. We divide 25 divided by 77, 23 divided by 77, 20. Basically, we normalize these scores, right, to get a probability. And that is just one method of getting the probabilities. And we end up with results as follows. We end up with 31% probability for the first individual, 29 for the second, 26 for the third, and 14 for the second. And now with some algorithm, we're going to pick four of these, okay? We're going to pick four, four individuals for reproduction, okay? So basically, what can happen, um, my algorithm, because this is 31% chance of getting chosen, it's probably going to be chosen. This one has 29%, it's going to be chosen, probably. So we just probabilistically pick four individuals and um, for mutation, right, for reproduction. And then we pick pairs, right? So here I'm going to pick four individuals because I want to pick two pairs. This is your own decision, but I'm going to pick two pairs so I always keep the same number of, of individuals in the population. So two pairs based on probabilities, and you see that, for example, I picked... I picked um, I picked this guy because it had probability of 31%, right? I picked this guy because it had probability of 20%, and I picked it twice, once to reproduce with once to reproduce with the guy above it and once to reproduce with actually the guy below it, right? And actually this probabilistically this last individual was never picked. This last chromosome was never picked. So I've picked my four chromosomes, okay? According to probabilities. So my algorithm picked this one, then this one, then this one again, then the third one. Okay? 
And what happens is that I will decide a crossover point per pair. So for this pair, the crossover point is going to be here. This when I divide, you know, this part mixed with this part and so on and so forth. Right? And the the cutoff point is going to be here, the crossover point for this other pair is going to be here. I just picked it randomly. Then what I do is I do the crossover. So I get the first part here, right, with the second part of this guy that gives me this individual, okay? And I pick the first part here with the second part here, and that gives me the second individual. I do the same thing with a different crossover point for the second pair, and I end up with my four individuals. Then what I can do is randomly select a mutation for these guys, right? And now what happens after this is I will compute the fitness function for these guys. So these four basically go back to step number one. Whoa, it's a wavy road here. They go back to step number one. And I compute a fitness function, probabilities, select two pairs, do crossovers, um, do a mutation, and do it so, so on as long as I have to until some termination condition is met. A termination condition might be, for example, that one of the heuristics for these things is 28, one of the fitness functions is 28, in which case I have reached the goal state, which is no queens are attacking each other, or until you know I've done it enough times that I am making no progress, for example. Now, things to think about. What would a mutation look for like a tree, right? So how would you represent a tree as a chromosome? And what would a crossover look like for a tree? How, how are crossovers performed? Right? If you want to get a section of the tree replaced on the other part of the tree, those things you need to implement. Right? Now, genetic algorithms work well for mixed uh, problems, continuous and discrete. They're less susceptible to get stuck at local optima because they're always uh, restarting and there's like a mutation which is some randomness there. They're computationally expensive, though. I mean, they might take a long time to uh, converge, but on the other hand, they can be performed in parallel. And there is no math in the process. Uh, the objective, the fitness function, though, might be hard. You, you might have to have a specific... So it might be hard to compute how many non-attacking pairs of queens are there, right? But it might be hard to compute other, um, other objective functions. So if you think, for example, a place where genetic algorithms are used, which is scheduling, so if you're thinking of, say, a maintenance scheduling, right, then computing the things that you have to maintain and the constraints on the schedule, they all affect the fitness function, and it might, it might be a complex fitness function at the end. And just as a mode of uh, algorithm pseudocode, genetic algorithms go like this. You initialize time zero. You initialize the population at a given time. You evaluate the fitness function here of the population. And then what you do is increase the time select the parents, recombine or cross over, mutate, evaluate again, see who survives, and then do this all the time until there's a, until you're done. And when you're done, just return whatever was the best. And that is basically genetic algorithms.